All righty. So now with those announcements out of the way, let's jump into our notes for tonight. Yeah. So last week we started talking about evolution, how we have ancient organisms that have changed over time and become the modern day organisms, plants and animals that we see here on earth today. We talked about how we can make charts of those changes, how we made those cladograms on Thursday, those graphs that had animals on the top and we saw who was related to who, which different groups shared similar traits and stuff like that. So evolution is kind of this very big, very broad picture thing, it takes millions of years to happen. And it's all about this slow, gradual change from an ancient organism to a modern one. Today, we're gonna to be talking about a couple different things. One of them is sort of the process by which natural selection works, what actually causes organisms to change over time. And we'll talk about exactly how scientists set up those cladograms and group organisms into related groups based on things that they share. All right, well, what happened to my thing? That's weird. Anyways, so evolution is also sometimes referred to as descent with modification, meaning that our modern day organisms, the plants and animals that live on Earth today, are descended from ancient organisms. They have ancestors from millions of years ago, but they have been modified. Right. One of the things that we talked about with evolution and with fossils is that the plants and animals that we have today don't look exactly like the plants and animals from millions of years ago. They have been modified. They look different than their ancient ancestors. Evolution is a change in populations over time. So groups of plants and animals. One plant or one animal can't evolve in their own lifetime, right? An animal is born as one way and it'll die as that same species, that same type of animal. But populations, groups of animals can change, right? From generation to generation, you can have one group of animal that slowly changes and adapts and turns into a modern group. So evolution is how we get new species from earlier species. So kind of like what we saw on the cladograms, we have some sort of ancient ancestor that then branches off into two or more different species. So this was evolution. This is kind of what we were going over last week, this whole idea of over millions and millions and millions of years, ancient organisms, will separate and branch off and turn into new populations and become the modern organisms that we see today. But how and why does it happen? Why do we have this change from ancient organisms to modern ones? What's going on that's causing them to become modified, to look different from their older ancestors? Well, there's a process by which that happens. Oh, first, so here's our kind of big tree of life, right? So all of these different organisms, all these different animals, all share common ancestors at different points on this tree. And like the question was asking about on Monday, the closer that the animals are together, the more similarly related that they are to other ones. So like over here, we've got the mammals, like elephants and whales and humans, and we're all relatively closely related, at least closer than we would be to birds or amphibians. But mammals and birds and amphibians are all more closely related to each other than they are to arthropods, things 
like insects and crustaceans and arachnids like spiders and scorpions. So how does it happen? How do we end up with all of this huge variety of life on Earth that all comes from ancient common ancestors? Well, the way that we do that it happens is by something called natural selection. So if evolution is the process, natural selection is the mechanism. It's kind of like the why or the how that it happens. And the basic ideas behind natural selection are that not everybody has the same chance of survival when they're born. Out in the wild, out in nature, it's a pretty harsh place and you better be ready to compete if you want to survive. If you want to get enough food and get enough water and shelter and make enough babies to pass on your traits to the next generation. There's a lot of competition out there. So some organisms have better characteristics to survive and reproduce than other ones. So some are more likely to survive than other ones. Sometimes you hear this as people call it survival of the fittest. Only the most fit organisms are going to be able to survive. And this is true, although in biology terms, fittest doesn't mean exactly what you think it means. So in humans, fitness is like health or like exercising ability, right? Really fit people are super healthy. They exercise a lot. They have really strong muscles and stuff like that. And biology and in evolutionary biology, fitness doesn't necessarily mean who is the healthiest. It means who can survive and reproduce more than others. So in terms of natural selection and evolution, the goal of the game is reproduction. You want to be able to have the most surviving number of babies out of everybody else in your population. If you are the healthiest and you are the best able to survive and the best able to reproduce, then you will have the most number of healthy babies. So in natural selection and evolution, fitness refers to how many babies, how many offspring are you able to reproduce. So if you're super, super healthy, but you're not able to find any mates and produce any offspring, then your fitness is not that great. So that's what we mean by survival of the fittest, is that the most successful organisms are not only the ones that can survive and find resources, but also the one that can pass down their survival traits and survival instincts down to the next population. So over time, this natural selection causes certain traits to be favored more than other ones. So if organisms live in like a really cold environment, like, right, like they live up and the Northeast forest, or they live up in the tundra in Canada, then organisms that have adaptations to keep them warm, like thick fat under their skin and fur that helps repel sunlight or that helps absorb sunlight, excuse me, and mechanisms in their body to be able to hold on to heat and energy really well, those guys are going to be better able to survive and reproduce than ones that do not have as good adaptations for the cold. So eventually, say if a group of organisms, a group of animals moves from a warmer area to a colder area, the colder ones, the ones that have the better adaptations for being cold, will be able to survive and reproduce better. And eventually the whole population is going to have those traits. So maybe at the beginning, only a couple animals had good cold weather traits. After a couple dozen or a couple hundred generations, 
all of the animals in that group are gonna have those cold weather traits. And that is what we call evolution. It's when natural selection causes these traits to either be gained or lost across the whole population. So evolution, this slow, gradual change over time of organisms losing and gaining characteristics and going from ancient to modern organisms. Natural selection is how that happens. The idea that some organisms with certain traits will survive and reproduce and pass on those traits better than other organisms until eventually everybody in the population has the new traits. All right, is this kind of sort of, oh, I see, we got a couple of people drop in and out, but is this kind of making sense so far? Is there still anything about this natural selection evolution that seems kind of confusing or that you're not really understanding as of yet? All right. The last part, the last one is it kind of it's kind of this point down here. Yes. All right. So natural selection is what causes certain individuals, certain organisms with a specific trait or characteristic to survive and reproduce better than the other ones. And eventually, after many, many generations, when that specific trait gets passed to the whole population, that is when evolution happens. That's when you end up with the whole, the whole species, the whole population having this new trait. So a really famous example of this is some finches, which are like types of birds that have been studied in the Galapagos Islands in Central South America. So millions of years ago, there were finches that had just kind of one regular, like medium-sized beak. So they were kind of good at eating some of the seeds that were on the islands. But over time, one group of finches started to become specialized on eating like really big seeds. So one group that was in an area that had larger seeds, a couple individuals were born that based on the genes they inherited from their mom and dad, they had beaks that were a little bit bigger than everybody else's. And they were able to be really successful about eating these big seeds. So they were able to eat a lot, be really healthy, have lots of babies. So now some of their babies inherited this big beak trait. In the next generation, they were able to eat a lot, be really healthy and have lots of babies. So eventually over time, this bird species shifted from having kind of medium sized beaks to having bigger beaks in order to eat the large seeds better. And when all of the birds had the larger beaks, and that was kind of like the standard trait for the population, that is when, that is what we would call evolution, is when the whole population changed from having medium beaks to a couple hundred generations later, everybody had big beaks. So we had a different species now than what we started with before. That is evolution. Natural selection is what happened when the birds with the bigger beaks were able to eat the big seeds and be fatter and healthier and have more babies than all the other birds. So they were the fittest birds in their generation. They were able to have the most number of babies compared to all the other birds because they were so fat and healthy with all their seeds.
So natural selection is this idea that certain individuals, certain animals that have good adaptations will be better, be healthier, have more babies than other animals in their generation. Evolution is what happens when over hundreds of generations, you have more and more and more individuals that show up with that new adaptation, that new trait that helps them. Does that help explain it a little bit, Naya? Yes. Okay, very cool. So in order for natural selection to happen, there are four things that need to be going on in our population, in our group of animals. The first one is that individuals in a population are different. If every single person, every single animal in the population got the exact same traits every single generation, every single year, then natural selection could not happen because nobody would be better at doing anything versus anybody else. But if the individuals are different, then some of them might have some better or some worse characteristics. Some of them might develop the little bit more fat under their skin that keeps them warmer in the cold temperatures. Some of them might develop beaks that are a little bit bigger so they can get at the bigger seeds that the other birds cannot. So by having these different individuals, individuals that are everybody isn't just an identical clone of everyone else. There are all sorts of different traits and characteristics. There is the chance that some of those traits will be helpful and will help the animals survive and reproduce better, have better fitness. So step one, individuals need to be different. Not everyone can be the same. Step two, these differences need to be passed down from parents to offspring. So we talked about this a lot when we went, we were talking about genetics, right? We talked about with the Harry Potter examples, we went over the red hair and the freckles that got passed from the mom and dad to the kids. I talked about some examples like a widow's peak or an attached earlobe that are kind of simple physical characteristics that get passed down. So in order for natural selection to happen, these traits, these adaptations that help the animals have to be able to be passed down from generation to generation. If they can't get passed down, then they're not gonna be able to spread through the population and cause evolution to happen. So it has to be something that you can inherit from your parents. So we have different traits across the population and we can inherit those traits from our parents. And more importantly, we can pass those traits down to our offspring. So if something, if there's something in us that makes us better at eating or finding shelter or finding a mate than the others, we want to be able to pass that down to our offspring so they can be successful at it as well. Number three, more organisms are born than can survive. Like I mentioned earlier, nature is a constant struggle. It's a constant competition to make sure that you have enough food, you have enough water, you have enough shelter from predators than compared to everybody else. So here are some salmon eggs in a stream in Alaska. And salmon lay millions and millions and millions of eggs each year that give birth to millions of tiny baby salmon. But the reason why Alaska's rivers aren't completely chock full of millions of salmon every year is because most of these baby salmon and these salmon eggs are probably not gonna make it. Depending on the conditions that year, it might only be like a 7 or 8% survival rate for these hundreds and thousands and millions of eggs compared to the number of adult salmon that actually live 
and are able to lay more eggs. So not everyone that's born is going to survive, with the idea being that some organisms are gonna be better and some organisms are gonna be worse at survival. So not everybody has the same traits. They can pass those traits down from parents to kids to grandkids and not everybody is going to survive. Only a handful of individuals in a population are gonna be able to become parents. And then finally, individuals with better adaptations will have more offspring in the next generation. So out of everybody that is born, only some will survive. Most likely the ones that have the best adaptations are not only gonna survive, but they're also gonna be the best at breeding and having healthy babies. So here we have a female wolf spider. I actually, when I was working um, in, on my master's degree up in Ohio, I did a lot of work with wolf spiders. That's what I worked for, worked with for my thesis paper that I wrote. And female wolf spiders are unique in the spider world because after their babies are born, they'll let the babies climb up and carry them around on their back for a couple days. Eventually the babies will all disperse and go off to live their own little baby spider lives. But for the first couple days after they're born, they ride around on their mom. So the idea is that the mama wolf spiders that let their babies ride around with them will have more babies survive on to the next generation. Likewise, the baby wolf spiders that climb up and ride around on their mom are more likely to survive than the baby wolf spiders that don't. So this was a trait that developed in some wolf spiders that eventually spread through the wolf spider populations. So at some point, thousands or millions of years ago, wolf spiders did not do this, but then some moms started letting the babies climb around on their back. Those babies survived better and then had their own babies who they let climb around on their back. And eventually, most of the wolf spider moms were letting their babies ride around on them. It may have taken millions of years and thousands of generations, but that trait spread through the population and evolved in the group. So, the individuals with the better adaptations will have the better fitness, which again, doesn't mean that they're necessarily gonna be super healthy and in shape. It just means that they're gonna be good at surviving and having lots of babies in the next generation. So sometimes these are called the four characteristics or the four tenets of natural selection. You have different individuals in a population and you inherit those differences from your parents. Not everybody that's born in your population is gonna survive. Sometimes a few of them might die. Sometimes most of them might die. But the ones that do survive in general have the better adaptations and therefore have more offspring and the next generation. So in the next generation, there's gonna be more individuals with the traits from the successful parents. So as hundreds and thousands of generations go by, eventually the trait that made those parents successful at the beginning spreads throughout the population. So now most of the parents and most of the individuals in the population have that trait and that is what we call evolution, is when natural selection causes new adaptations and new traits that help species survive to spread through the population so that most everybody has a shared set of traits. Again, they're not all the exact same. They're still different. There's always natural selection going on. 
But evolution happens is when natural selection has gone on for so long that the modern species, the modern adaptations are not exactly like, they don't look exactly like the past species. So again, when we went over evolution last week, we talked about how species that are alive today don't look exactly like the species that were alive tens of millions or hundreds of millions of years ago. And natural selection is why. As those millions of years have gone on, new traits, new adaptations have developed in individuals. And then if they're successful at helping those individuals survive, they eventually spread through the population and cause the population to be different now than it was initially. So these are our kind of four tenets or four laws of natural selection. In order for natural selection to happen, in order to have this survival of the fittest, all four of these things need to be true. All right. So natural selection and evolution is one of my favorite things in biology to talk about. I think that it is super fascinating and interesting, but it is kind of a lot to take in all at once and think about all at once. So does anybody have any questions so far? Anything about natural selection or evolution that you're still concerned about or curious about or confused about? No, oh, thank you. All right, Julio. So a great example of how natural selection works happened in the mid 1800s in something called the English peppered moth. So over in England, there is this type of moth called the peppered moth. And when scientists first started studying it, they found that there are two color variants. So two different colors of peppered moth that you could find. One of them was this kind of white speckled color and one of them was this dark black color. So these are the same species. They're the same type of moth. It's just some of them are born kind of whitish gray and some of them are born black. So we have these two different peppered moth colors. So again, if we think back to our tenants of natural selection, whoops. We have light and dark colors. So they inherit this color from their parents. So dark peppered moth parents will tend to have dark peppered moth babies and light parents will tend to have white babies. The main predator of peppered moths are birds. So again, not everybody that's born. So we have individuals are different. They inherit their traits from their parents. So they inherit this difference from their parents. Not everybody that's born will survive. Peppered moths are eaten by birds, which hunt using eyesight. So the moth color that camouflages the best will have more offspring in the next generation. Does everybody, does anybody know what camouflage means? Like when I say something is camouflaged, does anybody know what that means? Yes, it means like it hides itself within the nature around it. Mm -hmm. Exactly. So camouflage is when you like blend in with your surroundings, right? And it's hard to see. We're actually on Thursday. So 
a couple of days from now, we're going to talk all about camouflage and how it works. So as you can see, if you're in a dark environment, imagine that you're a bird. You have pretty good eyesight, maybe not quite as good as like us humans, but birds tend to have pretty good eyesight and they're really good at finding differences. So they're good at finding like red berries when they want to eat fruit hanging out in the green leaves. And they're good at finding the brown worms when they're squiggling around through the green grass. And they're good at finding white peppered moths when they're in this kind of darkish background. But the black guys are camouflaged. They kind of blend in. Similarly, if you're in a lighter colored area, the black dark colored moths stand out a little bit more, but the white peppered moths blend in really well, right? The modeling, the like patchiness on their wings blends in super close with this white background. So why peppered moths are such great examples of natural selection is that when scientists first started studying them in like the early mid 1800s, white was by far the dominant color of peppered moth because in their environment, most of the trees and the rocks where they had their habitats were this kind of light whitish grayish color. So the trees had like a white gray kind of bark. So the white guys blended in really well. And so they thought that the black color was kind of like a rare, uncommon color variant. So it popped up every now and then, but they never found that many of them. It was always about like 70, 80% white colored moths and 20, 30% dark colored moths. Then mid 1800s means we're in the industrial revolution, which means we're making more factories that are burning coal to produce steam in order to power engines and machines for their factories. And in England, a lot of these factories were pumping a lot of smoke and soot out into the air. And it was settling on the trees around the towns. And so what scientists found is that as the years went on and more and more trees became dark colored with kind of this soot covering them, they started seeing the dark color variant become more and more present. They were finding more and more dark colored moths versus lighter colored moths. And the hypothesis, the guess, is that all of a sudden, the dark colored moths were able to blend in and camouflage with their environment a little bit better. And the white colored moths weren't camouflaged as well anymore. They were actually kind of sticking out. So they were easy for the birds to spot and eat. And so in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, in areas close to towns where there was all this soot on the trees, they found that there was now 70 to 80 percent of the dark colored moths. But in areas further away where there is less soot and less dirt, they still found that the lighter colored moths were prevalent. So even after just a couple decades, and the areas close to town where there was the soot and dust on the trees, we had this change in the population. The population changed from being mostly light colored moths to being mostly dark colored moths. And it's all because of natural selection. As the forest got dark with the soot and the dirt, the white colored moths that used to camouflage better were standing out and the black colored moths were having better camouflage. So suddenly the, the black colored moths are having more offspring in the next generation. So more of the newborn moths are darker colored versus lighter colored. And so eventually that causes this shift in the population from lighter colors to darker colors. And it's all because these birds started eating more light moths than dark moths. So that's kind of the basic principle behind how natural selection works.
either a new trait appears or the environment changes, suddenly certain or organisms, certain individuals with a trait are able to survive and reproduce better. And eventually over time, it causes the population to change and to become more and more and more like the best surviving trait. So more and more dark colored moths. So we had different moth colors that are passed down from parents to offspring. The moths are eaten by birds, so the moth that can camouflage best will have the most offspring. When the type of moth that camouflage best changed, when suddenly the black moths were able to camouflage better than the white moths, we saw the population evolve and become more biased towards having black moths versus having the lighter moths. So natural selection, this selection for the best camouflage, the most fit moth, caused evolution, caused this change from mostly lighter colored moths to mostly darker colored moths. So that was only in the span of a couple decades, which is like nothing in evolutionary time. Usually evolution can take hundreds of thousands or even millions of years for these changes to fully spread through the population. All right, does anybody have any last questions about evolution or natural selection or our moth example from right here? All righty. So the next thing that I wanted to go over with you guys, and the last thing that we'll talk about for today, is that thanks to natural selection and evolution, we have a huge amount of diversity on Earth, right? If you think back to that, one of those first slides I showed you with the big branching tree, there are millions of different species of plants and animals on Earth. But something that scientists like to know and something that we talked about a little bit already is how do we determine who is related to who? What is the scientific basis for saying, okay, these animals are closely related and these plants are closely related and these other animals are closely related. We talked a little bit about on Thursday about cladograms and how we can use traits to kind of separate out which species is the more ancestral, the more basic, to which species has the most number of these traits. But what if we wanna do that for all species? What if we wanna figure out exactly who is related to who? So we do that, we create that cladogram and we figure out these relationships through something called classification. So classification is arranging these groups based on their similarities. So kind of like the cladogram that we were working with on Thursday, the further you get up the graph, right, the more traits that the organisms had in common, right? So like there is the one that I think the last one was like chimpanzee and then human were the last two on the Cladogram. And chimpanzees and humans both had a backbone and a spinal column. They both had four legs. They both had hair. They both lacked a tail. And then they were separated because humans walked on two legs and chimpanzees did not. And so, based on their similarities, oh, no worries, Brandy. Good to see you. Thanks for being here. Based on these and many, many other, many other similarities between them, scientists pretty early on were able to put humans and apes like chimpanzees and gorillas really closely together 
on the evolutionary tree. They had a lot of similarities between them. So classification also has a fancy scientific name of taxonomy. And it's essentially all about trying to figure out exactly which group does a certain organism belong to? Which group does an organism share the most number of characteristics with? So taxonomists are responsible for identifying and naming organisms. So whenever somebody thinks that they have found a new species, like a new species of spider or a new species of fish or a new species of insect, Taxonomists are responsible for looking at it and trying to figure out, is this really a new species or is it a different type of a species we already have? And then they're also responsible for naming the organism. So not only does it have its common name, like a, a monarch butterfly or a chimpanzee or a green anole lizard, Organisms also have scientific names that are unique to that organism. And we'll talk about those in a little bit. So there are a whole bunch of different reasons why it is really useful to classify organisms, figure out exactly which group that they belong to and give them their own specific scientific name. So it's a good way to accurately and uniformly name organisms, meaning all organisms have a scientific name that's set up in the same way, and we can figure out exactly which group those organisms belong to. Having these taxonomic, these scientific names, also prevents things called misnomers, like things like a starfish and a jellyfish that are not really fish. Right. In English, we call them starfish and jellyfish, but they're not fish. They don't have scales. They don't have a backbone. They don't swim with fins and look out through eyes. They're in a different group entirely. So in science, they are given a name that is different from a name related to fish. And all scientific names have a basis in like Latin or Greek. So that way you don't have a scientific name that's different in like English versus Spanish or Spanish versus German versus French or something like that. All a scientific name for an organism is the name that all scientists can use and everyone will know exactly what they are talking about. For example, if I were to put in front of you a small furry mammal that had a white striped black body and was very, very stinky and smelly, you'd probably call it a skunk. But if you were in Germany, you'd call it ein Stinktier. If you were in France, you might call it una mufette. If you're in Spanish, you might call it, I forget the Spanish name, Zorillo, Zorillo. I don't even know what language this is, a she -she. So all of these mean skunk and their own languages, but these are all different words to describe the same thing. And scientists don't like that. We don't like it when there's lots of different words for the same thing. We want one thing to have one name. So instead of having lots of different names in different languages, if we give it a scientific name, then all taxonomists, all scientists can describe this guy right here as Mephitis Mephitis. That is the scientific name of the common North American skunk. Mephitis Mephitis. So that way, even if scientists speak different languages, they can figure out which animal or plant the other scientist is referring to or talking about. So the scientific name of an organism is true across languages, across regions of the world. 
So this specific type of skunk is the only one with this name. There might be, I don't know if there's other types of skunk out there. There might be other types of skunk out there. They might have similar names, but this skunk, this type of skunk is the only one that has this specific name. So the guy who originally came up with this idea for giving all of the plants and animals in the world their own specific name was a scientist in the mid 1700s named Carolus Linnaeus. He was an early taxonomist, again, a scientist who was interested in naming and classifying animals and plants. And he tried to group organisms based on their structure. Much like we did with the cladograms on Thursday, he tried to say, okay, these two organisms look really similar. They have a lot of the same characteristics. So they're probably in a pretty similar group with each other. And he developed the naming system that we still use today. So anytime an animal is given a scientific name, there is a specific system that you have to use in order to name that animal or that plant. And Linnaeus was the guy who came up with that system about 300-ish years ago. So the system that he came up with has a very technical sounding scientific name of binomial nomenclature, which is really just a very fancy way of saying two word name. So binomial is like two, like two numbers. And then nomenclature is like the official name for something. So binomial nomenclature is just a fancy way of saying a two word name. So like Mephitis, Mephitis earlier, two words. In that case, they're the same word, and there are a couple animals out there that have names that are two of the same word. But all plants and animals that have been discovered and described by science so far all have unique two-word names. So, like, for example, we as humans, we are homo sapiens. Uh, the spiders that I worked with when I was in Ohio, we had Pardosa milvina and Tigrosa helluo. I'm trying to think of other common ones, and I can't think of them off the top of my head right now. Uh, I think chimpanzees are pan troglodytes, I believe. So every single plant and animal that has been studied by science on Earth has its own unique two-word name. Again, it's all because it helps to cut down on the confusion. So if I'm talking with another spider scientist from a different part of the world, and I say that I work with the North American wolf spider, there are a lot of spiders that could be called the North American wolf spider, depending on where you're from. But if I tell him I'm working with Pardosa milvina, he'll know exactly which type of spider that I am working with. So this two word name cuts down on the confusion and the fact that depending on where you go in the world, sometimes the same animal can have different names. Even here in America, especially for things like snakes and lizards, the exact same Lizard can be called different things depending on where you go just in the same country. But having a nice binomial nomenclature two word name means you know exactly which snake or which lizard that you're referring to. Oh, so this little cute guy over here, this masked trash bandit, AKA the common raccoon. For a binomial nomenclature, we use two names. The first name, refers to the genus of that organism. So genus is kind of like a small group of very, very closely related animals or plants. And then species refers to exactly this animal. 
Again, they're based on Latin and Greek. Usually when they're written out on in print, so like on a paper or on a computer, they are italicized. The genus name is capitalized, but the species name is not. So instead of like in humans, when we give two names, like Michael Stanley, the M and the S are capital. And a species name and their binomial nomenclature name, the first word is capitalized, but the second word is not. So while in America, we might call these guys raccoons, their scientific name is Procyon Lotor. So again, capital over here, lowercase over here. Procyon is the name of the genus. So there are a couple different animals that fall in the raccoon-like genus, but there's only one common North American raccoon. So Procyon Lodor, the raccoon. Some other species names include the giant panda, Alluropoda melanoleuca, the polar bear, Ursus maritimus, and the grizzly bear, Ursus arctos. Again, they each have two names. The first name is capitalized, the second name is not. And the polar bear and the grizzly bear are actually in the same genus. So these guys are all types of bear. They all fall under the bear category. But these guys are even more closely related to each other than they are to the panda bear. They're in the same genus. So they have the same genus name of Ursos. But then Ursos maritimus refers specifically to the polar bear. And Ursus arctos refers specifically to the grizzly bear. So that is how species are named. And that is why species are named, to cut down on confusion and make it so that one specific name goes with one specific species. So depending on what type of species that you're working with, there are rules for how you're supposed to name the species and kind of conventions that you're supposed to follow. If you find a new species and you want to name it something, you usually have to get it approved by some sort of international congress or international convention. And the biggest thing that they do is make sure that there are no duplicated names. Again, there are millions of species that have been discovered and described by science. And every single one has a different name. And so these big governing bodies just try to make sure that we don't accidentally name two different species with the same name. So depending on what type of animal or plant that a species is, it could fall underneath a whole bunch of different groups. So a, again, a taxonomist is somebody who studies naming and classification. And so a taxon is a category into which related organisms are placed. So whether they're the same genus or in the same family, like the bear family, we would call those things taxons. So there are different levels of groups, right? from super, super broad groups like vertebrates versus invertebrates, having a spine versus not having a spine, all the way down to super specific groups, di differentiating between uh, panda bear versus the polar bear and grizzly bear. So we have these different levels of groups from a super broad group that encompasses tons of different animals to a super specific species that's only the one animal. 
so the way that they get kind of ordered, and you don't have to remember the exact order, but kingdom is the biggest one. That's basically like plants versus animals versus fungi versus bacteria. And then phylum, which would be things like vertebrates versus invertebrates. Class and order, which are kind of like subgroups of those. Family, which is usually like in mammals, it would be things like bears versus the dog type animals versus the cat type animals versus the ape type animals. And then genus and species are our two smallest, most narrow categories. So I like picture representations of this a lot better because I think it does a better job. So again, domain and kingdom are kind of our super big, huge umbrella groups. And then we cut them up smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller to bring it down to genus and species, where that name comes from. So you can kind of think of this like this. The kingdom of Animalia contains tons of different animals, from grizzly bears and black bears and pandas, foxes, squirrels, snakes, sea stars, fish, insects, spiders, all that stuff falls under the kingdom of Animalia. So if you're classified as an animal, you're in this kingdom. We can then narrow it down a tiny bit into the phylum of chordata. So chordata essentially means that you have a nerve cord and a backbone. So sea stars, the little star-shaped guys that live in the ocean, they do not have backbones. They belong to a different phylum. But snakes and squirrels and foxes and pandas and black and grizzly bears, they all have backbones, so they're all in the phylum chordata. We then have the class mammalia. So these are mammals, things that are warm-blooded, have hair, produce live babies, feed them with milk. Those are mammals. So coral snakes are not mammals. They are reptiles, which is a different class. So reptilia is the class of reptiles. But mammals still includes things like grizzly and black bears, pandas, foxes and squirrels. And then carnivora is groups that mainly eat meat. And so the bears and foxes are mainly carnivores. Same thing with like the big cats, but squirrels are not carnivores. They are rodents. They're in the rodent order. So they'd be somewhere else along with things like mice and rats and rabbits and stuff like that. Family is a pretty narrow group. And so Ursidae is the bear family. So within carnivora, you have the bear family of Ursidae, things like grizzly bears and black bears and panda bears. You have red foxes are not bears. They would be in the Canidae, Cana Canidae family, which it would be things like uh, dogs and wolves and painted dogs and wild dogs and stuff like that. And then there would also in carnivora be like Felidae, which would be like the cats, like lions, tigers, house cats, bobcats, stuff like that. And then finally, not all bears are made the same. So the genus Ursus is mostly North American bears, like the grizzly bear and the black bear. And then finally, there's only one species of grizzly bear, Ursus arctos. So kingdom phylum class, very big, broad categories that encompass a lot of different organisms. But the more you narrow it down, the closer and closer and closer the more and more similarities that you find, the narrower and narrower your categories get. So you can kind of think of this as our cladogram from the other day, right? So all of these are animals, so they're all in the kingdom animalia. But then if we add on the trait, okay, you have to have a backbone. Well, that gets rid of the sea star. Okay, you have to have fur. Okay, well, that gets rid of the coral snake. Okay, you have to mainly, mainly eat meat. Okay, well, that gets rid of the squirrel. Okay, you have to have fur, or you have to have a backbone, have fur, eat meat, and be a type of bear. Okay, that gets rid of the fox. 
And then we can narrow it down from there into our genus and species. So kingdom phylum, big classifications, family, genus, species, narrower and narrower and narrower based on more and more and more similarities. So this is kind of what that Linnaeus guy started to do. He started to group organisms based on, okay, these guys are kind of similar, so they can go like in a big group together. But then these three guys are really similar, so they can go in a more narrow group together. Uh, we're not going to really worry about the domains too much. Essentially, eukarya is the domain of most multicell organisms on the planet. Things like plants and animals and fungi and stuff like that. And then archaea and bacteria are more like single cell organisms. Again, we're not really going to worry too much about the different domains. But in that eukarya domain of multicell organisms, for the most part, we have our different kingdoms. Animalia, which we were just talking about, plantae has the plants. Fungi with mushrooms and yeasts and mosses and stuff. Well, not mosses, like stuff like that. And then protists, which are little like protozoans and algae type organisms. These are the ones that you guys are probably the most familiar with. So again, the more narrow that you get, the smaller number of animals or plants that you have in your taxon, in your group. And this classification is based on these evolutionary relationships. So initially when we were doing these classifications, it was all based around similar traits. Organisms that look similar got put into similar groups. And for the most part, that works pretty well. That's a pretty good way of figuring out who is related to who. But as we got into the more modern area, era, we were able to start looking at organisms' DNA in order to figure out whose DNA is the most similar to whose. Because that tells you more about evolutionary relationships than just how something looks on the outside. If you really want to know how close related two groups are, you have to look down at their DNA. So this DNA evidence has actually unearthed a number of surprising findings in terms of evolutionary relationships. So here we have a rock hyrax. It is a small furry mammal that lives in Africa and likes to live in kind of these rocky outcropping type places. And scientists, when they studied its DNA and were doing some DNA analysis to see its evolutionary history, made a somewhat surprising discovery. So before I tell you guys, I wanna hear a little bit from you guys, just based on how this guy looks, what type of animal would you say the rock hyrax is most closely related to? What does he kind of look like? It kind of looks like a ferret. All right, some kind of ferret type animal, solid guess. Other guesses, what does a rock hyrax look like he might be related to? What is the little animals that look like they can fly? It looks These just guys like cannot fly, unfortunately, no. They pretty much just live on the ground and in. No, I'm saying it's a little, it's an animal that looks just like it, but it can fly out, out of trees. It's a little, it's like really, really small. Like a flying squirrel kind of thing? A sugar yeah. glider? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah, yeah. Maybe mm -hmm. a mouse. 
I don't know. Maybe they eat it. Kind of like an otter. Oh, otter. I like that guess. Otters are some of my favorite animals. So yeah, they got kind of like the curious looking face and the little paws and stuff. And so when they did the DNA test to figure out exactly where the rock hyrax fits in in terms of evolutionary relationships, they actually found that it was not super closely related to ferrets. It was not very closely related to sugar gliders or to otters. It had some ancient ancestors that it was related to, but in terms of modern day organisms, the rock hyrax is most closely related to the elephant. The African elephant and the rock hyrax are more closely related to each other than the rock hyrax is to other small furry creatures. So even though they look completely different, based on DNA analysis of their evolutionary relationships, at one point in the apparently not too terribly distant past, these guys had a common ancestor together. And then a few million or 10 million years ago or so, there was some sort of divide that happened. And assumingly there's lots of ancestral species that we no longer have around anymore. But eventually two of those lines that divided ended up with one being the African elephant and one being the rock hyrax. So again, while just comparing based on similarities and similar features is a usually a pretty good way of figuring out who is related to who, sometimes you have to go to the DNA in order to determine exactly what are the cousins, what are the relatives of our different species. So that's just a little biology fun fact for you guys there. So out of all of the species that have been studied so far in science, uh, insects make up by far and away the most number of species that are out there. For a couple of different reasons, insects are really, really, really great at creating new species. With 751,000 different species of insects. We also have vascular plants, things like trees and flowers and shrubs and ferns that are about 250,000 and other, so all non-insect animals from snails to crabs and lobsters to fish and jellyfish to mammals and reptiles and birds, they all make up about 280,000 of the species that we've studied so far. And then we have a couple thousand different types of bryophytes, which is things like moss, uh, 20,000 different algae, 30,000 protists, uh, about 70,000 fungi, and about 4,800 bacteria. So one way when scientists are in the field, one way that they figure out exactly what type of animal that they're looking at is through something called a dichotomous key. So no, not like a key that you use to open your house, but a key like a paper key that tells you what you are looking at it. So dichotomous is a fancy way of saying two choices. So a dichotomous key is actually pretty simple and in my opinion, kind of fun to use. So it's called dichotomous or two choices because it gives you characteristics in pairs. So you'll have a type of animal or a picture of an animal looking at you and it'll say, okay, does it have A or does it have B? If it has A, go to step two. If it has B, go to step 10. Kind of like if you ever read those like choose your own adventure books when you were younger and you got to a part and it was like, okay, if you want to open the lamp, then jump to page 72. Or if you want to keep exploring, then jump to page 139. Kind of similar idea here. 
is it either it has to be one trait or the other. If it's the first trait, you go where it says. If it's the second trait, you go to the next part. For, so, for example, here we have three kind of similar looking organisms. We have this guy with these tentacles and these spots up here. We have this glowing guy with lots of little wavy tentacles down here. And we have this little planty looking guy with all of these big kind of chunky tentacles up here. So let's say, let's start with this guy right here. Now, obviously we all know that this is an octopus. Uh, ooh, Ashley with a good observation. Yes, Ashley, I don't know for sure if this is a blue ring octopus since it is in black and white, it looks like one. And yes, a blue ring octopus is intensely venomous. It's one of the most venomous animals on the planet. So if you're ever swimming in like uh, Australia or New Zealand and you see a tiny little pretty octopus in the water that has little blue spots on it, don't touch it. If it bites you, it could kill you in a couple minutes. So the way that our key works is that we have say, okay, we have an octopus. Our first step here, 1A and 1B, says tentacles present or absent. All right, well, tentacles are present in our octopus, so let's go to two. Step two right here, we have eight tentacles, so we have an octopus. With this guy down here, we step one, tentacles, we have those. Go to step two. All right, step two is right here. Uh, this guy has more than eight. There's a whole bunch of them dangling down here. So if you have more than eight, we've got to go to step three. Step three says if tentacles hang down or they're poking up, this guy has tentacles that are dropping down. So we've got to go to step four. Balloon or not balloon shaped body. It does have a balloon shaped body. So this is a jellyfish. And then finally, same series of steps for the anemone. Tentacles are present, so go to two. We have more than eight, so we go to three. The tentacles are upright. They're pointing up, so we have a sea anemone. So that is a relatively simple way, although it can get very complex. I had to do this for a college class once, and doing this with like tiny flies under a microscope is not fun. But with these basic steps, we can identify different types of seemingly similarly shaped organisms or organisms that have some somewhat similar characteristics. So the reason why I wanted to go over that dichotomous key with you guys is that that's gonna be important for your homework tomorrow. So your daily assignment for today is pretty simple and straightforward. I essentially want you to list out our six or our four tenets of natural selection that we talked about. So each one has a place where you can write in your answer and then also an example of that tenant, just in case you need a little bit of help remembering which one goes with which type of trait or characteristic. So we talked about these four tenets of natural selection a whole lot right up at the top of the class. So hopefully that should be pretty straightforward. And then in terms of that dichotomous key, that's gonna be important for working with your homework tomorrow. So scientists have discovered a new planet and that planet has on a variety of alien species. We have 10 examples of species right here and a dichotomous key listed out right here. So for each one of these species that has things like a large head or a small head, three eyes or two eyes, a star in its chest or not, spikes or no spikes, arch-shaped or N-shaped legs, each one of those traits you can find on this alien right here. And so I want you to use the picture of the alien 
and the dichotomous key down here to tell me which species, which one of these species is represented by aliens number one through 10. So again, pretty simple, straightforward. You're essentially just gonna be going back and forth between the dichotomous key and the picture and saying, it does have this, it doesn't have this, it does have this, it doesn't have this. Oh, it does have this. So this must be a narrowest fusses species. And then moving on to the next one. All right, sorry that I went so fast at the end there. I noticed that we were getting right up on the end of our class. Does anybody have any final questions, comments, concerns about the notes for today or the homework for today or tomorrow?